Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Diana Arias, and I'm with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Transition Age Youth Considerations for Increasing and Maintaining Participant Engagement. We are very excited to have with us today Dr. Michelle Munson, who is a professor at NYU and whose research looks at mental health services, specifically intervention development and testing, focusing on adolescents and young adults. Uh, Dr. Munson previously shared her knowledge with um, all of you with our CTAC um, audience in May of this year during a segment of Conversations with Dr. Tony, where she talked about defining, understanding, and supporting the healthy development, uh, the healthy identity development of transition age youth. Um, so again, I encourage you, if you'd like to visit our website for that particular recording, um, but again, we are very excited to have Dr. Munson join us uh, to again share her information on this very important topic and this population um, as well. So I'm going to pass it along to Dr. Munson to get us started. Thank you, Diana, and welcome everybody. I'm really, really glad to be here and just want to say a couple of things. I see some familiar names coming in through the chat. Um, that's great. Excited to be here and hopefully end with a a great dialogue talking about transition age youth and engagement, really engagement with services. Um, and I guess just by way of introduction, I also like to say that before being a professor at NYU, um, I worked for quite a long time actually as a youth outreach director, um, developing and directing service learning programs for young people in sort of the positive youth development space. Um, and then I also worked in clinical social work for some time in the borough of Queens at Elmhurst Hospital. And so some of the work that I'm going to talk to you about today comes from, um, you know, a long time spent with transition age youth, their loved ones, their families. And really that's what began this uh, journey, which is now sort of in the research space. Um, again, really, really happy to be here. Just want to acknowledge my colleagues at New York University that are part of the Youth and Young Adult Mental Health Group and all of these various funders who have funded this work, which has been going on for um, over a decade. So just important to do that. My main objectives today are to very briefly review transition age youth mental health and then talk a little bit about treatment engagement and thinking both about initial engagement and then maintaining transition age youth in services or in treatment. And then I want to spend most of my time really exploring, talking to you about uh, different practical strategies that we've used in our intervention programs. Um, but to get started, I wanted to ask you to just chat in um, answers to a couple of questions to get us going. You can either chat in an answer to both of these questions or just one. What are some of the things that inspire you the most when you're working with transition age youth? Um, so older adolescents, young adults, what are some of the things that inspire you um, when you're doing this work or when you're supervising others that do work with transition age youth? And then also, what are some of, the, some of the concerns you hold? Or what are some of the concerns your agency or organization has when um, doing the work with transition age youth? So um, feel free to throw those answers into the chat. Um, and I see resilience, absolutely, so much resilience. Um, we see strengths, different, different um, types of strengths that young people bring in. I know it can be incredibly inspiring to um, learn about how young people are healing, how young people are managing after having um, dealt with a lot of different kinds of challenges in their communities, in their families, in their lives. Um, I see a lot of uh, inspiration of their positive outlook, joy, creativity, absolutely, really maps onto a lot of what our team has seen over the years. Um, and one of the things that I hope you'll see as a thread through today's webinar is that a lot of the work and the strategies that we use in the program I'm going to talk to you about today really 
have come from transition age youth and have come from us being inspired by conversations we've had with them in our field work, learning about the kinds of things that they might be willing to or excited about engaging in and talking about mental health. So we take very seriously the reality that all of us as human beings want to experience some joy and some pleasure even when we're dealing with our mental health. I also see some challenges coming in, a lack of availability of services in certain localities, absolutely so, so important. Another concern, motivation, uh, motivating youth to stay engaged. So this is great. I think uh, a lot of the uh, things coming into the chat are very, very relevant to questions we're still asking here at the Silver School of Social Work. And I think this community um, that we have here, thanks to CTAC, uh, is really interested in um, growing and learning together with transition age youth to improve services and to ultimately improve families' lives. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit. I'm gonna go through some of this a little bit more quickly, uh, but just to sort of le level the playing field, so many of us care about this period of the transition to adulthood, right? From older adolescence to young adulthood. And just some of the reasons why this period is so important, right? Is there still so much development going on, brain development? And we see both just being in the lives of young people, clinically working with young people, and then just again, being human beings and families that this period can really launch young people onto real positive life trajectories. And also sometimes intervening with us and with services and supports, we can prevent um, negative trajectories for young people. So it's often considered a critical period, a critical period where there can be um, a fork in the road of sorts for, for young people. It's also a time of identity development, identity really sort of formulation, beginning to answer questions that have been on the, on the minds of teens for a long time and having to really make some formidable decisions about what do I wanna do with my life? What's my next step, right? Um, and I just love this image on the left-hand side by Stern and colleagues, which really just shows us the whole um, ecological systems framework and all of the different aspects of, of society and of one's ecology that are impacting this identity development and that are impacting who I am and these decisions that I'm making, these critical foundational decisions I'm making about my life. Do I wanna continue with education? Do I wanna get a job? Right? What do I want to do with my significant relationships? And in 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 the interest of of what many of us care about, what are going to be my decisions about healthcare? Right. And so, just very briefly, these are some data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And what you see on the left hand side, the uh, area circled in red in both graphs. Um, represents the transition to adulthood. Young people who are 18 to 25 have the highest rates of mental health challenges, but yet use services at the lowest rates. And again, many of us on this webinar either know these epidemiological data or can sense that from the work that we're doing at our own um, agencies and organizations. It's also an important um, question that has been increasingly on the minds of folks um, around access, which is right different from continued engagement for young people who find their way to services, find their way to us, but actually there's alarming data that has increased since COVID-19 about the lack of access two services for so many transition age youth. And this is just a graph from the Youth Ask Youth, youth, Ask youth um, Project, which was serving um, uh, almost a thousand young people. But this shows that 
there are high percentages of youth who didn't have access to therapy when they felt they needed it. And you can also see racial disparities in this figure showing that more Black African American young people, almost 50%, um, felt that they didn't have access to therapy when they needed it. So we have these questions about utilization, engagement, and access, which are really important for transition age youth. And just back to that notion around this particular developmental period for a moment, in adolescence, there is just by nature of the developmental period and where young people are in their lives, there's more support services and systems built in often to young people's lives, the schools that they're going to, families that they've been living with, and friendships, right, that are often um, a part of their lives during their teenage years. And in young adulthood, we have found in our work, certainly some people have a very natural transition and those support services and systems, new systems emerge for them. But for others, some of these support services and systems are more of a question mark and might fall by the wayside. So before getting into talking about some of the strategies for engagement, I think it's important just to note there's a lot of multi-component interventions for transition age youth. Some are evidence-based practices, some are promising practices um, listed here on this slide, inc including these very innovative integrated youth services that are emerging in Canada, um, our neighbor to the north, these uh, what they call hubs um, for, for young people. Um, we have them now emerging in the US uh, as well, the first one, Alcove, out in California, associated with Stanford University, but where there's mental health, physical health, social services, and peer support all in the same site, which they're finding can reduce stigma and um, engage young people in all different kinds of services at the, at the same uh, physical location. So I'm gonna talk for a moment about this multi-dimensional nature of treatment engagement. And then we are going to uh, really get into some of the practical strategies that I hope you find interesting and potentially useful for your own work with transition age, with transition age youth. So all of those programs that I just showed on this slide and many, many others that you might be using in your own organization, in your own agency or your own private practice, often talk about the challenge of engagement, the challenge of even when a young person shows up to a first session, what do we need to do to be able to maintain these young people in continuing to um, come to services? And then also beyond attendance, um, invest in their health care and really become involved and deepen that therapeutic alliance with their providers. And so in the work that we do here at the Silver School of Social Work and the intervention that I'm going to share with you, we measure both engagement as it relates to attendance or showing up at our services, but we also measure um, additional uh, variables of engagement that move toward more of attitudinal dimensions. So how involved are the transition age youth when they show up at a particular service at a particular program? This is just a uh, image from some work that um, we did in the uh, early 2010s that la led to a theoretical model which informs the strategies that I'm about to share with you. And all that's important to sort of look at here, if you come back to these slides after the webinar, is there is a set of five important, you can see under that mediating C through H, kind of categories of factors that emerge in studies that we've done as being critical factors for whether or not transition age youth engage in services and then continue to engage in services. Things like their beliefs about whether the treatment or the services can be helpful, 
social norms. So do the important people in their lives that they care about, like their boyfriends, girlfriends, mothers, support them going to services? Image management is about stigma. Also emotional reactions. What are young people's emotional reactions to um, engaging in different kinds of mental health supports and services? And then levels of self-efficacy. And so from that theoretical work, it's really important um, uh, just to say for the non-researchers on the call, the Just Do You program, which I get this great opportunity to share with you about, it didn't just evolve out of ideas we had here in the academy. It actually evolved through deep conversations in the field for hours with transition age youth, with providers, talking about what would it take for you to show up at services and then for you to actually be really involved and deepen that alliance with your provider. And so we heard repeatedly, again, those barriers I showed you in the previous slide were important in facilitating engagement or getting in the way of engagement. And so my colleagues and I has spent a number of years taking in a lot of those ideas and continue to go back into the field and work with young people and young adults to evolve this set of strategies for young people, which are part of a very brief program we call Just Do You. Um, it's an orientation program provided during intake for transition age youth. And we conceptualize this program as a program that could be leveraging intake really for any evidence-based practice. Before I get into the strategies, I'm gonna share a little bit of data with you because it's important before sharing with you a program or a service to show you the data that we have, um, right? To suggest that it's a promising program. But the idea here was for transition age youth and young adults who actually access a program, in this case, it's a program called PROSE, which is a New York State a recovery and rehabilitation program, they would receive these strategies, these engagement strategies that are part of Just Do You, or what we call Prime Connect in-house, in order to prepare them to engage more in PROSE, the larger treatment program. And so the idea, the simple idea here is what can we do better? What can we do better during intake to leverage that key period to motivate, as somebody said early on, inspire, prepare, and orient young people for this service or this treatment that is to come? And so as I said, in-house, we call this program Prime Connect. But it's called the Just Do You program, and that was a name that young people came up with in some of our early pilots. And again, it's important to note we've been working on this program for, you can see, a decade, um, really taking these inter intervention modules and trying them out and getting young people to respond and give us feedback. And they have evolved. They have changed based on what young people um, have told us, either you know, is very engaging or kind of falls flat and isn't, isn't working. And so we've evolved this together with young people. And the goal of Just Do You is, again, to really improve attendance and level of overall investment um, in services or in treatment. And so Prime is about preparation, readying, inspiring, motivating, empowering, again, young people to engage in the actual services, perhaps the services you provide at your organization or your agency. And Connect is all about these strategies that you're going to hear about. It's all about opening up space for these kinds of mental health conversations and utilizing what young people find as more attractive ways to talk about mental health. So we use narrative storytelling, we use some traditional psychoeducation, and then we use creative arts and technology, all in service, again, to prepare, ready, inspire, motivate, and empower young people to become more connected and show up at their mental health treatments. 
So the simple idea of this work is that the Just Do You modules, these activities, if you provide them before uh, beginning an evidence-based treatment, perhaps transition-age youth will engage more in that service, in that treatment. And so I'm gonna share very briefly, we just completed a randomized trial of Just Do You, randomizing young people either to receive Just Do You before beginning PROSE or to have intake as usual and begin the program as usual. And very briefly, we have found this work has is, is been published in the Journal of Adolescent Health that in fact, those who received Just Do You as part of intake were more engaged. They had a higher level of buy-in to the pros services that they were attending. And you can see in the lower box that the differences in actual attendance were um, significantly different, favoring just do you at P is less than 0.056. So nearing significant differences um, there in the outcome of attendance. And then importantly, we looked at these key barriers that I showed you in the theoretical work. And we found that Just Do You significantly improved compared to those who received intake as usual, beliefs about pros, also levels of stigma. And then importantly, the young people's trust in their providers and the young people's belief that their providers at pros were credible which ultimately were associated with engagement. So this is some data that is still in review, but just very, very briefly, we have also found that Just Do You in fact was associated with higher scores on a measure of personal recovery, right? Which is about goals and future orientation. And what we found in these data was that Just Do You was associated with improved recovery through changing level of involvement in pros, level of involvement and engagement in the services. So that's promising um, data that we're now sort of thinking about in moving toward next steps. So what do we do in Just Do You? What are the strategies that we use? And so I hope this is if you're bored so far, <laughs> the more exciting part of the webinar and hopefully will lead to some um, questions, conversation. So these modules are two in this current iteration, 90 minute modules that the young people go through during this critical period of intake. And you can see in this slide, we embedded a fancy research term called experimental therapeutics and all that means is these different intervention components on the left-hand side are utilized and conceptualized to specifically hit these targets, these target mechanisms of change that we know are associated with engagement and recovery. So things like hope, beliefs about the treatment, stigma, also emotional reactions to showing up at services such as fear, right, or anxiety. And so firstly, we do use some psychoeducation in Just Do You. In the case that we just um, studied of PROS, we talk with the young people and we provide them with information about the PROS program. So what is it in fact, that once you get through treatment, you're gonna start being um, invited to engage in. So we talk about the different kinds of groups and services within the program. We also go through an exercise with the young people talking about what does it mean? What does it look like to have a trustworthy provider? And this is both, I think, good psychoeducation, but also something that came out of our extensive research is that there's a lot of mistrust generally of, of mental health providers. And so we go through an exercise where the social worker and peer provider talk with the young people about what they think that might look like and have a dialogue about that. And then we talk about their role and what can they expect and what, how can they be involved in making decisions about their services as part of the program. 
So we have an element of just do you that is steeped in more traditional psychoeducation. And then we use music in the modules. And so we have a library of songs. And this is one example, uh, Warrior by Demi Lovato. Um, but the social worker, the modules of Just Do You are provided by a social worker and a peer provider. And along with the young people who are going through the modules, they'll choose one of the songs. Um, and we this one thing that's been just phenomenal since developing this program in 2012 is the increase in the number of songs that are coming out with mental health content. It's incredible. There's actually an article uh, recently published in JAMA that's talking about the increase in mental health content in music. And so this library is just growing. But again, what we feel has been um, somewhat successful with transition age youth is again, from many, many years ago, listening to them that they wanna be engaged in talking about their mental health with things like music, with art, with listening to people who have been there. And so this is an actual strategy that evolved out of hearing those kinds of messages from young people. And so in the act, actual modules, the providers and the young people choose which song they're going to discuss on that day. And then the young people are given lyric sheets that have the lyrics to the whole song. And the, the providers utilize different kinds of activities. Here you see from um, our, our manual, use your notes, sketch pads to create an image or write down some reflections about this song, a response poem or lyrics. A lot of these strategies and exercises that we use are, again, in service to opening up the space to have mental health conversations with young people in ways where they might be more inclined to engage. Another example of a song that's commonly chosen by the transition age youth is the song I by Kendrick Lamar, which provides, again, space to be able to talk about self-love and what does that mean to the young people. Also stigma, being resilient. And so again, these song lyrics chosen together with the young people, lyric sheets passed around, Sometimes the providers will play the song, but it's not just about listening to the song. It's about the intentional content of the song, of the music, to be able to just open up space for mental health conversations. And we have found over the years that young people are very interested, very willing to engage and talk. Um, sometimes it can be helpful also, we've heard from them to talk about their experiences when the conversation starts more indirectly with somebody else's experiences. So another important strategy that's part of Just Do You is recovery role models. And recovery role models, again, Just Do You is provided by a hybrid provider team of a licensed clinician and a person with lived experience who are conceptualized as being in a position of a role model, a important voice, a credible voice, a trustworthy voice for young people who has had some of the same lived and living experiences as the young people themselves. And these recovery role models in the modules, they co-facilitate the modules with the licensed clinician. And there are specific sections of the modules that the recovery role models lead. And they talk about things like sharing their experiences on specific parts of their lived and living experiences. So they share how they came to the point of being willing to attend and be involved with services. They also focus on things like managing stigma or sharing how they moved from distrust of mental health providers, maybe a little bit to become a little bit more trusting. And the idea here is important, I think, twofold. One is, I think, obvious and something we talk about a lot when we're considering 
utilizing peer supports um, as experts and as providers is really being purposeful in messaging. And oftentimes people with lived and living experience can have a very, very powerful impact for new participants, new folks who are just beginning to engage in services. And also we think about it as a team here at NYU, um, which is a, is a little bit different than some others conceptualize peer support, that it can be really important for our peer providers, our employees to also um, share parts of their lived experience that they have um, both discussed with supervisors, even role played sharing, and they continuously share in the modules. So we, we, we choose those uh, elements that they share with intention. And also the recovery role models share and get together with participants between modules or whenever questions might come up that they want to speak with the role models about. And then we use what we call technology-based narratives to engage certain content. And so one example that we have used, and in this recent study, we were able to test the utility of it, is utilizing a, a brief clip, it's about five minutes, where Mary J. Blige talks about her life experiences. And this is a clip that you can access um, on a website called Half of Us, which I have on the resources page, I'll talk about in a minute. But in this particular clip, um, Mary J. Blige talks about her situations in her life, and she really talks and connects how her thoughts about herself influence how she feels about herself and then influences some of her behaviors. And so as a team, we created in the manual, in the module, a set of, as we do with CBT, um, you know, content here that then the providers can put up on a flip chart to watch the video and have come in from the young people. Okay, well, what situations is Mary talking about? And these situations in her life, like being so busy and touring, how does she, what is she saying she's thinking about herself during this period of her life? And then how does that make her feel? And then what are her actions? And again, the idea of these modules is to try to create exercises that might attract or keep young people engaged and interested in talking about their mental health. And you can see on the right, in the study, we also um, just placed here, which is similar with the music, that the clinician and recovery role model can also choose other videos, other songs. The idea is, is that we want to create space to use these um, additional ways of bringing in content so that young people can talk together with the providers about these particular important aspects of treatment. And in this case, CBT is one of the module or one of the modalities rather that is used as part of the PROS program. This is actually another technology-based video we didn't use in the study that we just um, in, um, completed, but could be an additional um, useful narrative for those of you who might want to consider using some of these strategies on your own, which is a video of Jay-Z speaking about therapy and speaking about himself accessing therapy and some of the things that he has learned from engaging in therapy and how it has helped him. And so some of the key messages in this video um, are when Jay-Z says everything is connected, every emotion comes from somewhere. So you might be able to pose to young people, well, what emotions do you feel a lot in your day-to-day -day lives? Where do you think they come from? Again, belaboring the point to show that the sort of gist of this idea is to just think about creative um, and um, attractive kinds of activities that transition age youth might be interested and more willing to engage in as they begin their 
uh, mental health services or programs. And then lastly, we use a lot of visual art in these modules. So another thing young people told us in our research is that drawing um, and different kinds of creative strategies are ways that they are interested in, again, sharing about and talking about their experiences. And so we worked with a creative arts therapist from Brooklyn to create for this particular uh, program, a couple of exercises that the young people use in the second module to begin to think about their life experiences. Um, they can create an image of something or someone that inspires them or helps them when times are tough. And an important part of this element of Just Do You is creating the space to, to create. Sometimes it's visual art, sometimes it's poetry. Um, but also creating and opening up a space where the young people can then share with each other some of the images, some of their life experiences, and what the images or the words in poetry or rhyme mean to them. And so those have been some very powerful um, experiences for our participants. These are just a couple of the images. Um, one of the art directives is to fold um, a piece of paper in half and have young people create an image about the past and then create an image about how they would like to see their future and what are the goals um, that they have that are part of, of that for them. Um, and this is an untitled piece um, that image somebody shared around wanting blooms and, and their future to, to include different aspects of their life that would be blooming and, and you know sprouting off. So in conclusion, hopefully there's questions and comments and thoughts around this. Um, always looking to improve the work, think about the work. Um, but really, I think uh, most important for me has been that the Just Do You program or what we're calling Prime Connect has evolved from listening um, and you know, methodically listening to young people, thinking about what are the kinds of things that might increase their willingness to talk about their experiences and also uh, prepare for continuing to um, do the work that they might need to do in their uh, mental health care. Um, also, again, just want to say something that has stayed with me and that I talk about a lot, and I believe for, for myself in my own work that I do in my own mental health treatment, is that we want mental health care to be joyful, pleasurable, even fun, okay? And so we think about that a lot. In what ways can we create strategies that even though we're dealing with oftentimes things that have been really difficult, in our lives, doing that in a way that can be um, pleasurable and also create community with, with others. And so I think this work, um, you know, kind of uh, in conclusion, uh, I like to say it shows that there's a lot of potential and promise for non-traditional approaches. And I think that it's important to note that You'll see probably um, a lot of you during the pandemic, post-pandemic, there's a lot of incredible nonprofit organizations, groups across the country, across the globe, actually, that are increasingly using these kinds of creative strategies. Sound It Out is one of them, right? Talking about bringing music and different kinds of non-traditional strategies to, for example, parents and kids or to providers and participants. But what's really cool here, I think, is that we now have some data to support that these non-traditional approaches, in fact, are promising. So my hope is that some of this work, first of all, you know, might raise ideas for you and raise ideas for strategies that you can use in your own communities. Um, as I was telling 
uh, colleagues here, you know, if you're interested in our manual and some of these resources, uh, you can certainly write me um, directly. But I also think about just utilizing components of, of, of what we've created in Prime Connect, maybe, you know, beginning to utilize different kinds of music, different kinds of creative arts activities with transition age youth and young adults who we know, um, you know, one clinic director told me in this work um, when we were just starting out, you know, the way she thought about it was that transition age youth, they have a hard time sticking it out, <laughs> staying with services, right? They might come to the first or second appointment, but it's like, how can we get them to stick with it? And so I think these, this work and these data suggest that some of these more non-traditional approaches can be, um, you know, promising in, in doing this work and doing this kind of work. So again, I would encourage you to consider um, the manual or again, using some of these uh, practices um, um, on their own. And, and I imagine some of you on the webinar are, are already doing this, which is also exciting. So I would love to hear from you. I'll just end with these resources. Um, Half of Us is incredible. It is a resource for all of you that comes out of the Jed Foundation. Um, and what they have on their website is by kind of content area. They have these clips, these clips of different people, for example, talking about stigma, talking about addiction, talking about um, depression, all kinds of different topical areas. And this is where we found some of these tech-based narratives that we then as a team sort of listened to and tried to think about how can we use this content with these different communicators talking about important mental health concepts like I, I didn't show you all of them. We have other ones that talk about stigma, all in service to transition age youth then being able to open up space and have mental health conversations um, together with their um, provider team, with their peer support specialists and their um, clinician, whoever's running the module. And then of course, um, just, you know, resources like everyone in Just Do You gets their own sketch pad and their own um, 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 color pencils to create and to create while they're in the modules um, sitting together. So I'm going to leave you with that. Hopefully there are some comments uh, or questions, concerns that you can either uh, type into the chat box, or I think somebody was going to come back in and facilitate some questions. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate that. Um, so we have had some comments coming in uh, to all the audience members, and co some coming in uh, privately to us. But overall, um, you know, thanking you for this great presentation. Um, also, sort of the thinking outside the box, and um, we did another comment here as well in terms of yes, yeah, providers, you know, you really do need to think outside the box and really focus on what's going to be engaging to them. And if it is music, then how do we incorporate that um, into their services? So a lot of thank yous and a great uh, presentation. So um, we certainly um, thank you for that. Um, and then so some of the questions that came in, Michelle, um, what suggestions do you have for families of transition age youth who view mental health services as maybe not effective or needed? So I think kind of jumping off of what was just recently mentioned, right, the stigma around mental health services. Um, so not just for transition age youth, but also their family members. How do we do that sort of collaborative engagement and family engagement? Yes, yeah, so, so important, Diana. So I actually think um, if we read the literature um, in this area, moving beyond the youth themselves, we do, we see this, a lot of the same barriers, <laughs> right? And actually a lot of the same facilitators that are key, that are important for parents, for families, in, and for the, for the young adults, often for partners, um, boyfriends and girlfriends who are so important to helping young people show up and continue to be involved in self-management, right, of health generally. And so 
I think a lot of the same kinds of strategies can be used with families, certainly. We've already seen many of them um, studied with families like psychoeducation models. In fact, a lot of your colleagues at McSilver work on that and also family peer advocates, right? Credible, credible messengers who can speak to some of the effectiveness from their own lived and living experiences of mental health services for their families. Interestingly, throughout this process, also a number of the different staff um, and even young people have said to me, you need to just do you for my parent. You know, <laughs> You need a similar uh, manual that you've just given to me for my boyfriend, because they're not supporting me and showing up at pros. And so I think this question um, is so smart and that we all exist in the context of family, right? Family so broadly defined. And so we have to be thinking about barriers, right, for transition age youth, but also those really critical supports that's around them and love them and care about them because those folks are also critical messengers. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, and I love that sort of suggestion of creating a program for the families. Um, I think that's me wonderful. Too. Yeah. If anyone um, interested in doing that work, let me know. Great, thank you. Um, we did have a question um, in terms of, and maybe we can actually do this um, on our end, or if not, um, putting it up on a web on our web page. But um, someone was asking to the link to the published article um, that you mentioned. Um, so I don't know if you have that information handy, Michelle. If not, we can certainly look that up. And um, if we don't get a chance to do it on our chat here, we can certainly try to um, get that information from you and put it up on the training page. Um, so people, absolutely, I think absolutely. I can, I can give you guys links to the articles, um, and also for the, for the, uh, Jed foundation for the half of us link. I don't know if that's what they were referring to. Yeah. I mean, I think any resources that you have, I think would, would definitely be helpful. Um, great. Thank you. Um, we did have another question. Um, is there an opportunity to sign up youth for the just do you program? Okay, so that's a great question. So at this at this point, there is not. So the trial that we, um, you know, launched was all uh, from 2017 until COVID. And when COVID came, we had to shut down the effort. However, we are in the process right now of, um, you know not only applying for, but launching ad additional studies for Just Do You. So if anyone is interested, have them directly contact me and I can potentially um, give them the names of other folks who will be engaging um, the Just Do You program. But at this point, it's not sort of being utilized um, across any kind of program statewide or anything like that. Okay. Um, I know I saw a comment somewhere about, um, and, and maybe this is available in um, some of those resources or the articles that you were going to mention, um, Michelle, but the, the music. So I know you gave some of samples of some of the, the music that, that were um, the lyrics that were used. Is there like a list, a comprehensive list, maybe in the article, or maybe folks can reach out to you? I know your email address is on the webpage. What would be most helpful for folks if they want to get some of those samples? Yes, great, great question. So um, if they want to reach out to me, I can actually send them the manual and the manual has a, a set of them. And again, I mean, um, these were songs that were chosen with great intention. <laughs> And since they were chosen, there's so, so many more, but we chose the, it's about a list of 10 and it's cross genre, different kinds of music, but you'll listen to them and look at the lyric sheets. And again, they talk about the concepts like stigma, like, you know, um, the kinds of things that we're trying to address in the program. And I saw somebody put in the chat too, um, you know, do you have a link to the JAMA article, which I can also give you, Diana, mm -hmm. um, which speaks about sort of this, this just huge increase in the number of songs. But the specific ones that we used, I'm happy to share. Of course, I don't remember them off the top of my head because they did not come from me. Um, <laughs> but they all have the content that I think you would be really 
um, you know, able to use with young people um, and our songs that are very popular with young people. I don't fit into, you know, that, that, that developmental stage anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that because, yeah, there was an interest for that. So, yes, thank you so much. So, um, as Michelle just said, you can reach out uh, to her directly or if not, reach out to CTAC and certainly visit uh, the training webpage in about two to three days and we'll have resources up there for you. Um, another sort of couple of comments that came in and, and a related question to, um, to this. Um, so, several comments in regards to the lack of programs um, in groups specifically for transition age youth. So for example, someone earlier mentioned, when I have made referrals for young adults, they often report that the support groups are made up of much older people and therefore they are unable to relate to them and they typically stop going. So um, if we are in programs with mostly middle-aged or older adults, how can we think about group work differently to have um, their older peers uh, be recovery role models per se? Mm, mm, very interesting. Yes, I mean, I... I have spent, you know, my whole career trying to advocate for transition age youth programming, whether that is, and, and some of it, frankly, has led to, like I, I was showing um, some of the programs that we now have specifically for this age group, right? We have On Track New York, we have MST for emerging adults, we have the programs um, coming in across Canada but it's just not enough, right? And some of those programs are for specific uh, subpopulations, right? And so we know there are so many transition age youth who may not fit the criteria for these particular uh, specialized programs. And so how can we think creatively? And I, frankly, I think that has to do with all of us and thinking about bringing in clinical savvy and clinical strategies. And, and I love that you said group work because I think group work is so, so, um, you know, positive for transition age youth. And so um, it might be that we think about um, evolving and developing specialty transition age youth um, groups in our particular agencies and organizations. And then to your second question, I think that there is something really, really powerful. Um, and we saw this happen in our study that the middle age, um, or I would say also older young adults um, have possess, can share about their recovery that really speaks to the younger adults who are showing up. And so I didn't get enough time to talk about this. And if anyone's interested in talking further, um, contact me. But we really spent a lot of time conceptualizing our recovery role models and then interviewing them, training them, supervising them throughout the entire program. And these were older young adults. These were adults who were about a decade older than the typical uh, folks coming in to just do you. And I think with great uh, support, these folks, middle-aged folks can really not only provide such a powerful, credible message and service, but also find themselves feeling very empowered and impacted by being that provider and being that role model for the younger adults. Great, thank you. Um, and sort of piggybacking off a little bit, I guess, on, on that um, question and the response that you gave. Um, so I'm wondering about your opinion on effective preventative interventions for transition age youth. Steps mm. that have mm. to be taken before the enrollment in a PROS program, for example. Oh my gosh, I love whoever asked that question. Thank you so much. So this, right? I mean, this is really so key, so important. And this actually is what I think we need so much more advocacy around um, that what can we do in community? What can we do in, let's say, community-based organizations to provide different kinds of what I would call sort of mental health supports and mental health services 
in places like boys and girls clubs, in places like faith-based organizations, in places even like schools, where, you know, again, I sort of introduced myself by, because I really identify this way, as a youth worker who developed programs for positive youth development, you know, providing these kinds of opportunities for young people to thrive, to be part of community, to feel like I am contributing, to, to have just sort of collective experiences together, wh whether that's in a community-based organization, in a high school, right, that I do think make a significant impact on things like anxiety on things that might become depression or even losing touch with reality and experiencing some kind of psychosis. And so I think having those kinds of positive life experiences um, in the sense of positive youth development, these what we call right protective factors are key for prevention and critical. So I appreciate that question. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I wanna to try to sneak in one last question before we move on to our closing slides. Um, so is there, um, in, in regard to telehealth and where the mental health or behavioral health uh, services now, um, thinking about the information that you presented, um, can what you talked about today translate into telehealth as a service modality for transition age youth or are there some things that we need to keep in mind? Hmm. Great question. So I think, you know, there's a lot we don't know about telehealth, right? But I think one thing, one thing that is clear is it improves access. <laughs> Going back to that introductory slide, there's a lot of individuals who don't have access to come to a community-based program or, um, you know, uh, a have access to a provider. And so we know that it improves that. And I think some of these strategies and tools could be used in a context of seeing a provider um, in the kind of telehealth space, just like a provider would use them in person, right? As a tool, let's talk about these layers. You can use different kinds of um, technology-based uh, uh, mechanisms to achieve that. I also think that um, something that I've been working on since getting these promising findings is how can we think about digital components for some of Prime Connect? So can we evolve an app that young people would be able to access on their own and go back to some of the different kinds of messaging that they might have um, you know, talk to a provider about while they were at program. And so I think there is some potential promise also in those kinds of spaces that would provide some kind of mental health supports beyond physical face-to-face -face, uh, kind of service provision, uh, if that yeah. makes sense. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, just where we've been and where we're heading, I think there's a definitely a lot of a great amount of space to really sort of delve in a little bit more. So um, as we move towards um, our the final slide here on upcoming events, um, I do just want to highlight um, some of our upcoming events um, for this month of November. So please feel free to visit our um, web page um, on our final slide here. I do want to send out a big thank you um, to Dr. Munson uh, for sharing her information here as well. Um, we also have a link in the chat box, but in the chat box. So if you want to open up a survey, um, but if not, when you close out, a survey will pop up for you. I do just want to encourage you to fill that out because this offering and a lot of our offerings really do come from the feedback that you all share. So on that very last slide, you know, great thank you to you, um, Dr. Munson. A thank you to all our audience members uh, for attending. Um, again, the slides and the recording will be up on our training webpage in the next two to three business days, along with any additional resources um, that we'll also get from Dr. Munson, primarily the article one as well. So again, on behalf of CTAC, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your week. Goodbye, everyone.